Hey everybody, it's Ripley. All right, man, we made it through chapter six. We are officially in the business, and boy, we're in it deep. We're going to talk about inverse trig functions today. All right, and I'm going to give you some notation first because I want to beat this into your head. Remember back in Algebra 2 when we talked about the inverse of a function, right? This is the inverse of f of x, right? Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the property was the f invert, I keep doing that, sorry, I've been doing calculus all day, so the notation is a little bit different. f inverse of f of x equals f of f inverse of x equals x so long as so long as f inverse of x is a function and remember that was determined this implied that f of x was one to one which was the same thing as past whoops past the horizontal line test remember this so if we took a function and it passed the horizontal line test if it looked like that then when we have f of x because this thing passes the horizontal line test we know that its inverse is a function is a function now I'm gonna show you something here and it's at first it's gonna seem like it doesn't have anything to do with trigonometry but the idea is exactly the same let's look at f of x equals x squared alright so here's f of x badly drawn equals x squared, right? Now clearly it fails the horizontal line test. So its inverse is not a function, and we already knew that. So if I go like this, if I want to draw its inverse, remember inverses are symmetric across y equals x. So if I wanted to draw its inverse, it would look like that. And of course, I hope that you remember that the way to find an inverse is to simply switch x and y. So if I take x and y, if I take um, f of x equals uh, 4x cubed minus 1, and I want to find this guy's inverse, then all I do is go x equals 4y cubed minus 1, and then I solve for the y. So I get x plus 1 equals 4y cubed, y cubed equals x plus 1 divided by 4, so y equals the cube root of x plus 1 force and this is the thing that we would call f inverse of x. Okay, just a quick review. You've seen this already. And this one's nice because this thing is one to one. If you graphed it, you would see it looks very much like that. Only it would be whoop down here. All right. All right. So, what do we do here? Well, remember the whole purpose be, be find behind finding inverses is so that we can undo functions so that we can make things go away now algebraically speaking we've already played with this if I have x squared equals 9 it's very easy to undo the square I simply take the square root of both sides and I get x equals 3 if I'm only talking about the principal uh, square root well think about that x squared is this function the process of undoing x squared is to take the square root. Now, we run into this problem, and the problem is that x squared isn't one-to-one. Isn't -one. It doesn't pass the horizontal line test, and therefore its inverse is not a function. It's this entire graph right here. But that doesn't scare us. What we do is we say, well, screw it. We actually say that. We're going to pick a part of the function that is one-to-one. And then, once I've grabbed that part of the function, since that part is definitely one-to-one, -one, and quite frankly, it's arbitrarily chosen which part of the function we chose, whether it was the left-hand side or the part that I've, I've shaded in here. Once I've picked that, then I take the part of the function that's one-to-one, -one, and I get its inverse, which in this case is y equals the square root of x. Did you ever wonder why? Whoop. Did you ever wonder why y equals root x is the inverse of x squared rather than y equals the negative square root of x? Why did we pick the principal square root, the positive square root, rather than the negative part? Well, because it works best for us. It's easiest for it's easy for us to teach. 
it's easier for us to understand because we don't have to slap a negative on it. And quite frankly, we just kind of arbitrarily chose the positive side because it was better. Now, we're going to use this exact same technique when we're dealing with the trig functions for obvious reasons. Look at y equals sine of x. All right. Now we run into this huge problem. I really need to learn to draw a straight line. Ooh, that's pretty good, right? We run into this huge problem with y equals sine x, don't we? Because guess what? It ain't one to one. All right. However, think about it. Just like when we chose the right-hand side of y equals x squared, notice that the part of that y equals x squared goes through all of the values from 0 to infinity. Well, the, the left-hand side goes from 0 to infinity as well. So if I can get the same exact y values out, we refer to that as the range, then really only half of the function is necessary to get that range anyway. So we're going to employ that same technique right here. We're going to pick a part of sine, and we're going to make it one-to-one, -one, just that part. But we have to make sure that whatever we choose is going to pick up all of the values of the range of sine. So let's wrap our brains around this for a sec. The domain of sine we know is from negative infinity to infinity. All right. We know that the range of sine is from negative one to one. Right. We know that for sure. So I need to pick a part of the function that picks up all of the values between negative 1 and 1. This is 1 up here. This is negative 1 down here. So I suppose I could pick this part out here, but it makes more sense to pick the part that's close to the origin. So I'm going to grab all of this part from here to there. That is 1 to 1. It's got a range if I ignore everything else. So it's as though I'm looking at this thing through a, like a spyglass. I'm ignoring all of the other parts, this part out here and this part out here don't even exist as far as I'm concerned because they're not one to one. Look at it. It picks up all the values between negative one to one. It's clearly a one to one function. There's a lot of ones going on. So that's the part that I'm going to steal. Now, I'm going to steal, remember, when, I, when I'm going to actually sketch a graph of this thing. And um, what we're going to call this thing when everything is said and done is the inverse function of sine or the arc sine. You'll sometimes hear it referred to as. But I'm going to steal some points. The first point I'm going to steal is 0, 0. All right? This point right here, I guess I missed that just a little bit, but that point right there is pi halves, comma 1. And then this point down here is negative pi halves, comma negative 1. All right? Now, here we go. I'm going to pop over here, and I'm going to give you some notation. The first thing is, is what it's called. This is called the inverse sine of x. And if you look on your calculator, it's the button. If I hit second sine, this is what I get. Now, students will often look at that negative 1 and go, oh, because a to the negative 1 is 1 over a, then I should interpret this as being 1 over sine. Ah, we already have a word for 1 over sine. It's called cosecant. And they are different. They are not anywhere near the same. Because you've already seen what cosecant looks like, right? It's this guy that goes whoop, and then whoop, and then whoop, and then whoop. goes like that, all right? So this is an entirely different function, which we're, we're about to explore. All right. So I'm going to, unfortunately, I'm going to have to toggle back and forth between these to draw this. OK, first things first. Remember, for y equals sine of x, the domain is from negative infinity to infinity. But we really only carved out between negative pi halves and pi halves, didn't we? Remember back here? We only grabbed the value from negative pi halves to pi halves. So that's the part that we're stealing. That's the one to one part. That's the domain. The range is from negative 1 to 1. All right? Now, if I stumble back over here, remember when I find when I find the the um, excuse me, the inverse, all I do is I switch x and y. So I'm going to end up on my inverse with negative 1 comma negative pi halves and I'm going to end up with 1 comma pi halves. So let's stumble back over here. And i got to change the color of my pen. 
So I'm going to go over one. I'll call that one arbitrarily. I'll call this pi halves. And then I'm going to call this negative pi halves. What I do, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, because I want it to look kind of good. We'll call this one and this negative one. So remember, I still got 0, 0, passes through the origin. And I'm going to go 1, comma, pi halves. So this is the point 1, comma, pi halves. And then I've got negative 1, comma, negative pi halves, negative 1, comma, negative pi halves. All I'm doing here, ladies and gentlemen, is I am creating a new mother graph. Okay? Now, think about this. Look at what sine does. Sine goes like this. I'm going to exaggerate this. It goes, let me get this thing working. It goes like that and then like that. So wouldn't its inverse have to go because, remember, you've got y equals x is your line of symmetry with inverses when you sketch their graphs. So won't my inverse have to go like that? That's exactly what it does. I actually do the, you have to make the noises when you draw it or it just doesn't look right. And I end up with a guy that looks just like that. Look at that. And that's it. That's, that's the sum total of the whole graph. That graph is f of x equals the inverse sine of x. That's all you're looking at right there. That's the sum total of the whole thing. And the reason why is visualize sine x. If I try and continue this, what happens? Well, this guy starts to wrap back around. Just how sine wraps back towards the x-axis. Remember, x and y switches. So guess what? This thing's going to try and head back. Well, as soon as that happens, I lose my vertical line test. I no longer have a function. I no longer have a function. Now, let's look at this. Let's make this nice and pretty. This information was all about sine x. Let's write up the information about uh, the arc sine of x or the inverse sine of x. So y equals, remember, f of x and y are interchangeable, so don't be afraid. First and foremost, what is its domain? Well, the domain, look at it. The domain of the inverse is always the range of the function. So its domain is from negative 1 to 1. What is its range? Well, the range of sine is, neg is all reals. It's negative infinity to infinity, but we had to steal a 1 to 1 sliver. So the range is from negative pi halves to pi halves. Now, what does that tell you? Let's think about that for just a sec. What does that tell you? What it tells me, this range is the most telling thing. It tells me that arc signs spit out angles. Arc signs spit out angles. Now, let me put this into use for you really, really quickly before we get into this too much further. 